anybody who's really interested in growing their show is probably going to come back to the point of like, is my podcast any good? Why would anybody listen to it? And the first place I would start is why? Why do you think that you need a podcast? Most hosts never achieve the results they hoped for. They're falling short on listenership and monetization, meaning their message isn't being heard and their show ends up costing them money. This podcast was created to help you grow your listenership and make money while you're at it. Get ready to take notes. Here's your host, Adam Adams. What's up, podcaster? It is your host, Adam Adams, and I've got Adam Lamb on the show today. We're doing an interview, and I came from working in restaurants as a server bartender, and Adam Lamb is a chef, and he also teaches and coaches other chefs. He's got a couple of podcasts. One of which is called Chef Life Radio, a couple hundred episodes already there. And the other one is called Turning the Table, which is a top podcast, a top business podcast, where he and up as a co-host talk a lot about what's life after COVID. So we're going to dive into a couple of things. And one of the things that I think we'll do with Adam is something we don't always do. is just get more into his story, what he's doing. As you know, if you've been listening for a while, generally, my first question is always something poignant about like value. But I promise you, if you're listening, you're going to get some value. Adam's got a couple of podcasts. He's done hundreds of episodes. One of them's ranking really, really high. And so there's going to be a lot to be had. But let's go here first. Adam, both podcasts were started after COVID or was one of them started before COVID? Adam, I just want to first say thanks for having me on. It's oh, a pleasure. Course. And so Chef Life Radio, I started in 2014. It was meant as a drunken love letter. So I'm dating a Canadian woman. I'm in Canada. I don't have a work permit. So I think to myself, hmm, what do we do now? And I thought, let's do a podcast. Well, if we cast our minds back to 2014. Most people didn't know what a podcast was. And there was certainly no infrastructure on how to produce one. So I had to teach myself website building with WordPress and Blurberry and all these different things, use a bunch of different little platforms. Sometimes I tried to do it as a live stream at a certain time, like almost like an online radio program. And it was really meant just to go back to the crew that I had just left, which was about 125 culinary professionals in Western Virginia. And it was like a little lark, kind of fun, something to take my time. And then I realized, wait a second, there's more here than can possibly do. So we broke out 10 episode series called How to Be a Better Chef. Based on that, I was really excited about the possibility of coaching and mentoring culinary professionals and other chefs. So I went on the road to some American Culinary Federation regional conferences and national conferences and did a presentation called How to Have a Fulfilling Life because my experience of being in the culinary industry was fantastic, wonderful way to make a living. You make some incredible relationships and have some wonderful experiences, but it takes a great toll on your body. It takes a great toll on your mind. And as chefs, we're not typically taught to lead people or to engage in self-nurture. That's just not in our bag. We're part of the grind. There's this lionization of overwork where guys bragging about how many hours they put in this week. And really, it took me failing several times and having to leave the industry and then coming back with skills that I got from outside the industry, how to coach and mentor people, that kind of stuff to make a bigger impact. And so what I found was is as a marketing group, that chefs are pretty stubborn. They are completely comfortable with the amount of pain that they're in because they've taken on as a personal challenge that they're going to be the ones to carry the load. And what I know about that is three back surgeries, opioid addiction, getting fired from the best job I ever had, all in service to this idea of serving the mission as opposed to being in relationship with the people that were elbow to elbow with me. Because at some point in my life, I realized that it can't be me. It's got to be about the we. So once that happened, I started to focus outward and I thought that Chef Life Radio was a great service to the craft and to the crew. And I was fully employed during the pandemic. Then I started seeing how so many people were being either leaving the industry or had to, because based on their fact that the restaurant closed, thought if there was ever a reason to bring back Chef Life Radio, this would be the time to do it. So then I started back in earnest. And to be frank, man, I came back and said, I don't know anything about podcasting. Like I was blown away by the amount of support, the businesses to businesses that support podcasts. There was no anchor when I started. So cell phone in a quiet room or sitting in a closet, you can start a podcast. What I had to contend with was pod fade, which is you get some episodes in and then it just becomes too much of a grind or losing your why. So for me, it's been a process of learning from others, pretending that I don't know, always having the mind of the apprentice. And even now going back and revisiting the podcast because 
I want to make things very, very simple as far as the call to actions, be very clear about what's available for them. So Chef Life Radio is dedicated to chefs who want to enjoy their careers without sacrificing their lives. So anything in service to that. So let me make a couple notes. Simple sure. call to action. Yep. Let's start there. Sure. After hundreds of episodes, something that Adam Lamb is still thinking about, still focusing on, or got back to is making sure that he's a good podcaster. So he pretends that he doesn't know anything. He apprentices it. He asks questions. He searches. He learns. And one of the things he's doing today is simplifying his podcast with a better call to action. And I'm wondering, the listener today is a podcast host. So people that listen to this show, host shows, or are about to host shows. So they're probably new, meaning they've been doing it less than two years. They probably have less than 100 episodes, and you've got two or 300 on one podcast and one or 200 on another podcast. You've been doing it since before, whatever. What made you think right now that we've got to simplify the call to action? Mm -hmm. And what are you doing about it specifically? Sure. So I had to consider the funnel, how I get people into my other business, which is a coaching and mentoring business called Chef Life Coaching. And so I had to think, okay, so if it's an unknown quantity, if it's something that they don't understand, my first responsibility is to build trust. So as a host, to be able to provide content that is relevant to their experience that they can see themselves in. So like, yeah, I had that problem. And so coming back to that, I realized that there's probably some metrics out there. Like I need to know what's happening because typically... The show is kind of, I wouldn't say in your face, but it tackles some pretty significant problems. And what I found is that even though people are listening and enjoying the content, typically they won't respond, they won't email, they won't do anything because they've got found out. I'd give you an example. I talked to somebody who I hadn't talked to since 2000, who admitted to having trying to commit suicide twice and still had, how are you doing now? Well, I still have some ideation, but I'm like, well, have you ever listened to the podcast? He's like, I've listened to every episode. I'm like, well, why didn't you ever say anything? He's like, well, I don't know. But he said to me that there were times in his life when the podcast was like the only thing that kept him around. And I was blown away by that and thankful that I could provide that because again, during the pandemic and even now, there are so many chefs that are opting to not only get out of the game, but also to tap out of life. And on Facebook, it's every day, another chef gone too soon. Can I get a herd? And that really pissed me off because... I didn't want to know about a herd. I want to know what is anybody doing to provide resources to folks who may be in distress. And the fact of the matter is like, people in the restaurant industry, we're pretty much confrontationally averse. So if someone's having a problem, typically we look the other way. And so this whole pandemic was a great wake up and big media got in the way and said, oh, shocking news, sucks to work in a restaurant. Most of us already knew, but losing the narrative in such a way gave the opportunity to inform the public to somebody who didn't necessarily have our best interest at heart meant that we needed to get out there and have a more cohesive program. So getting everybody into the funnel, how do I get people into my email list? So in several different platforms, you can go in and you can see the consumption rate or the retention rate of your podcast. So for me, that was the first place to start. You can see in a graph form that people start off 100% of the people who started podcast are listening to it, and then it starts dropping off. And what I noticed is, is that right before the outro, almost in every episode, people are shutting down. They know the outro is coming up pretty soon. So they close it down. So if my CTA is at the end of my show, nobody ever hears it. <laughs> so that meant that I need to move it around and to make it simple, meaning that there's one action that I want them to take and that it's also supported by links in the show notes and also the transcripts. And I happen to be lucky enough to be hosted on Captivate as a hosting platform. And I got to tell you, man, there is not another hosting platform out there that is doing more for podcasters than that because they started out as podcasters. And so they added a guest booking page. Now they've rolled out monetizing opportunities where you can either take tips or a membership all within that particular platform. So it's very, very powerful and they're really set for growth. So looking at their metrics again and consuming that and trying to understand what content is catching on and which isn't. And I guess this is where probably my second point is like, I can get really jazzed about a guest being on like a show dedicated to chefs, but I brought on a relationship expert, right? And so chefs are like, what the hell is this, man? And at the very beginning, I explained that business is all business and then business is all relationship. So the better we are at establishing and deepening relationship, the better we are at our jobs. And consequently, I think we're happier. So I might think that that's a great episode, but if it doesn't get any traction, if it's fallen on deaf ears, then I got to rethink my approach because last season was all about providing resources. I'm thinking about the listener 
yep. not specifically being a chef or maybe one or two of them are. Sure. And I'm thinking like, what do we need to do to take our calls to action and what have you learned, Adam, to make the call to action the strongest, the simplest, sure. based on what you've learned from those metrics? Is there something that you could say to listener like, hey, I think you need to do this. Maybe one sure. of the things is put your call to action at this place instead right. of the end or what have you learned there? So again, chefs are very busy people. So their refrain usually is like, I don't have enough time. I don't have anything put on my plate. So I got to make things really, really simple. So call to action can sometimes be added to players. So when you click on Captivate Player, you'll actually be able to sign up for the email list without coming out of the app, which is great because if I'm asking somebody to take action, I don't want them to have to go out and then come back. The other thing is, is that typically someone who's into podcasting loves audio. So there's all kinds of lead generation things, free giveaways that you can promote, checklists, listicles, all kinds of different things. It just so happens that for podcasters or for people who consume podcasts, they like audio. So I stopped trying to trick them or convince them of like, here's a free PDF, here's a free ebook, stuff like that. What I did is I took my interview and I snipped out 10 minutes of it and created a separate episode called On the Dock. And that's the lead generator right there. So they get bonus content that they can consume right away. And again, it's within the same genre, same help. So figuring out what your guests or your listeners really want, that's a powerful thing. Now, when I rebooted the podcast, I was in some Facebook groups of chefs and I asked for 12 chefs who'd like to be my advisory council. And I had over 200 chefs say yes. So I built a Facebook group, basically the Chef Life Radio Advisory Council. And I constantly asked them questions about what content are they looking for? What kind of lead gens they like? What kind of membership community would they like to be in? Would they like to be in a Facebook or with off platform? So any questions that I have, I first start with them because they represent the OGs of the audience. And I realized that for a couple of episodes, I lost sight of the fact that the show is not about me. It's not for me. It's actually for my audience and my avatar. So now I'm looking for more ways to include them in the podcast, such as offering a 15 minute leadership audit, kind of like a hot seat and including that in future episodes. So to include more of the audiences actually participating within the show and not necessarily me being on a platform and giving them educational information. That's my next shift. Okay. I want to cover a little bit of this. Yep. 200 people is not small. Right. How did you get 200 people to join an advisory council? And is there any of that that could be valuable to a listener in a totally different genre? Sure. I decided that I didn't know anything. I took part in a podcast accelerator, which took me all the way back to the ideation and the foundational principles of the show. Who's it for? What's their transformational journey? Where do they end up ultimately? What gets them there? Because it's really about a story. It's not about tips or tricks or it's like, what's the transformational story to my listener that's going to resonate with them? Where are they at? Where do they want to be? How do I get them there? So part of that is going and then doing like a targeted daily engagement. Podcasting is one on one. It's a very intimate type of format, which is why when I asked the, the gentleman I was talking about earlier, why didn't you ever let me know? It took me a while to realize that when those earbuds are in your ear, it's like a one to one conversation that's happening. So he probably already felt <laughs> that he and I were talking about, like that he already got that out. So that wasn't surprising. Again, for me to go back and think about how do I serve? How do I get people to my podcast? Well, on my social media platforms, it's all scrubbed. All it says is, podcast host, Chef Life Radio, big letters. Then I went in finding groups that pertain to my avatar, which it just turned out on Facebook. There happen to be many chef Facebook groups, LinkedIn, not so much. So I focused on Facebook groups and would go in there making comments, posting questions, not blasting about my podcast. Nobody gives a fuck about my podcast. What they're looking for is to be engaging with one another because what happens almost by accident is someone will see a comment. They'll click on my face or my little icon, be taken to my profile. And then it says Chef Life Radio. I'm like, what? Or follow up with a DM about saying, hey, man, that thing that you were talking about, I did this podcast episode. Would you like to? So that's how I started building those relationships. And so when I also said, starting this new thing, looking for 12 people to build an advisory council, there were 200 people who said yes. And I just kept saying, okay, based upon the fact that I knew that some people were going to be engaging and some people weren't, but it would be good to have that pool. Cool. So you mentioned that on your Facebook, it's pretty straightforward talking mm -hmm. about what you do. Here's a couple of things that I noticed. You've got your background photograph on Facebook right now. Talks about what you do. It shows the Chef Life radio podcast. Uh -huh. And then what I like also is just to the right, it says burned out question mark. <laughs> Scan the code, book a call, 
problem solved. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Did a great job there. And I want to talk a little bit about your business sure. and how maybe less about the funnel than we've yeah. talked about in the past today. Mm -hmm. But when did you launch your business helping chefs? Was it before or after that sure. podcast launched in 2014? And how do the two meet each other? The Chef Life Radio mm -hmm. slash Turning the Table podcast and what you do for a living? Sure. Thanks for that question. It took me a long time to have all the pieces land. So again, started off in 2014 with a podcast, then did this 10-part series, realized that I could be in service to other chefs, and then took it on the road, realizing it wasn't really landing with them. I jokingly say to my wife, my entire life, I've been seven and a half minutes ahead of my time. I was writing content online a lot in 2016 about the business and being a chef and going back and looking at that stuff. It's as relevant today as it was then. So the fact is, is I gave up on coaching and mentoring chefs. So it kind of pivoted to men in general. And again, came up with this thing about most men are really comfortable with the amount of pain that they're in because they've been trained, chained and conditioned to be the good guy and sacrifice himself and his dreams for his family and that kind of crap. And as such, it's hard to get them into coaching. I shouldn't say that. I didn't know what I didn't know, which was how to craft a message and story that would be compelling to them enough to at least entertain a discovery call with me. So my coaching business had a bunch of different iterations, a bunch of different websites. It didn't all seem to land. And so after I stopped working and focused full time on this, I was driving with my wife and I said, wait a second, Chef Life Radio. So could it actually be as simple as Chef Life Coaching? I'm like, no, that can't be it. And actually went online and found that the URL was available. And that's how I've coalesced everything into one website and killed everything else, meaning dropped all the other websites. This one's my personal one. This one's my, no, I have one website has pages for just about everything, including speaking and all that kind of stuff. And so everything I do is in service to that, which is to get folks to that website so that they realize that I have programs. And again, I'm even thinking about getting rid of all my one-to-one -one coaching programs and just doing a group cohort, which is a time-based training. So getting 12, 15 people together and it goes for three months because right now I'm looking for how can I reach and assist as many people as I can, as efficiently as I can with the time that I have. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm on the website now. So the podcast was started mm -hmm. and then later you decided to put them together yeah. is what I think I heard. Okay. Yeah. I didn't understand the relationship between the podcast and the business until, to be frank, a little while ago and like how those could be seamlessly integrated with one another. Okay. And now they are together yep. and you're simplifying your call to action. Mm -hmm. You're focusing on it. Why two podcasts? Yeah, great question. Captivate allows, or for any plan that you sign up for, you can actually start your own little network, which means you can host as many shows as you want. And they actually have a functionality where further down the page, you can set like this network entity up. So I was working with a guy in Canada. His name is Jim Taylor. He runs a company called Benchmark 60, which is about labor productivity within the restaurant industry, which is a really tricky problem because most restaurateurs are reactive so they look that their labor costs are high. So then they start cutting back. And now all of a sudden they got a rush and people are waiting for tables. So what Jim figured out is that there's a way to actually forecast that by using a slightly different metric. Because once they see that that's possible and they are saving money, then the conversation is, okay, what do you do with that money? Do you reinvest it in your restaurant? Do you offer healthcare now for your employees? Are you starting to shift the entire conversation about that this is a shitty business to be in? And there's some operators that are really taken off with this. So when I first saw it, I'm like, oh man, that's the back door to the conversations about culture and how you take care of your people. So I was working with him and I was so enthralled by what he did. I was like, dude, let's do a live cast. Let's do a live cast on LinkedIn every Thursday. And he's like, what? And so every Thursday at noon, Eastern Standard Time, we do a live stream called Turning the Table. Then I set up a workflow through repurpose.io, which actually captures that live stream, strips the audio out of it, and then uploads it to my podcast provider. And I just go in there and finish the show notes and push publish. So it's a really, really easy way to create some traction around that particular thing. The other thing is it's weekly. So there's consistent production and producing and publishing episodes, which is some people say, well, consistency, that doesn't really... But with a live stream, it really serves because people start getting this on every week. And so the idea is to give a restaurant or manager one or two tips or tricks that they can walk into their operation on Friday and Saturday and start changing what's happening. Because the only way that folks are ever going to know that is by, I learn by doing. And so I imagine that there's others that are out there that do the same. Okay. Yeah. So I'm looking at maybe one of the most recent episodes. Uh -huh. 
But enough is enough. And you mentioned how it's one or two quick tips and tricks. Yep. And this one's about 40 minutes. How long are the episodes usually? Typically, we want to keep them around 30, 35 minutes. Okay. Yep. If I'm listening... And I just am curious what Adam Lamb, who's posted a few hundred episodes, would recommend. Would you recommend everybody try to keep it between 30 and 40 minutes, or is that just for your shows? Man, that's such a good question. Because of my listener group, again, chefs tell themselves that they don't have enough time. So any podcast, probably over 45 minutes, they're not going to listen to. So typically, I try to keep it to 35 minutes because I figure for most folks, that's their drive time. Okay, So they can be listening to it from their home to work or work to home. And I think this is incredibly important to use that time as a way to context switch both mentally and emotionally, because there have been times when I've come home from work and I get a little barky and my wife would turn around. It's like, I'm not your employee. I don't work for you. I'm not a cook. And speaking strictly of that relationship, it took me a while to understand that I needed to shift my emotion and my energy between work and home such that I show up home as the goofy, funny, loving husband that she's come to know so well, instead of this guy who's got a mission and wants everything in its spot. Out of curiosity, now this is just plain curiosity. Sure. Would it be better for a stressed out chef who's overworked 50, 60, 70 hours a week? Mm -hmm to apply the non-barky, fun-loving, joking, playful husband role while at work? Would it be a good thing or a bad thing? That is exactly my point about the whole thing. So I was so good about being about the mission that early in my career, I didn't give a shit about anybody else. I didn't give a shit about associate. They're there to fill a role and that's it. Two hands and a back. That's what I needed then. And pretty early in my career, I realized that that's not the way to do it. What's really required is to build a community within your organization, right? Mm. And people come to a community because they resonate with shared values. So number one, if I can't articulate my organizational values and they mirror mine, then I can't expect anybody else to show up. So one of the biggest lies that we told ourselves in the industry is that you leave all your emotion at the door. You leave all that stuff outside. And the reality is, is that that's impossible because no matter where you go, there you are. So in one way, shape or form, what's affecting you outside emotionally is also happening inside and vice versa. You have a shitty night, you come home. Typically, you're not going home. You're stopping at the bar because you want to relax a little bit or or bitch about how it sucks (laughs) and be a victim of your circumstance. And so... The minute I stopped being a victim of my circumstance, because as a victim, I have no power to change anything. It's happening to me. But as I realized that everything that happens to me in my life is a result of my actions, thoughts, or beliefs, then that meant that I can change it. And so my real message is, number one, stop believing your bullshit. Number two, ask for help. And number three, be coachable. Be willing to embrace a different perspective. And you can do that in different ways. You can do it by telling serious stories. You can tell them by humor usually works a lot. That's why I like to mix it up a little bit emotionally. And I'm also playing around with the concept of a third podcast called The Line Check, which is a 15-minute podcast, me speaking to them almost like as a coach or leader and taking those same concepts on how to be a better chef that I did before. And reworking them into this particular program, but I'm not there yet. Yeah. I would not advocate taking on anything more than one podcast <laughs> because it starts to divert your attention. And that's been my experience and could have the possibility of watering down the brand, right? Because as they yeah. start to associate you with different things, people get confused about what you're about. That's why I had to go back and embrace the fact that I'm a chef. I spent so much yeah. of my career, like not wanting to be related to a chef because I do other things. I write, I sing, all this other stuff. Then I just threw my hands up. I'm like, people recognize me as Chef Adam Lamb. And so that's the brand. And they know me as Chef Life Radio since 2014. So I get to bring this all together and stop fighting it, I guess, because trying to be seen by somebody else as something other than I am is just an ego story. And again, it doesn't really speak to what is my audience really looking for? Yeah. Well, let's take a quick break. And when we get back, I want to ask you just for anything that you've learned along the way, Mm -hmm. tips, tricks, strategies. Sure that a brand new podcaster needs to know or else they're going to fail. We'll be right back. Hey, my friend, as you know, this episode is sponsored by my company, growyourshow.com. We want you to be able to have the best tools at your disposal without costing you a whole arm and a leg. So right now you can get a free list of vetted equipment that like mics, mixers, webcams, sound treatment, editing software, everything that you need. I created the whole PDF with direct purchase links just to save you time and money to help it be more convenient for you. So this free PDF will help you skip all the guesswork. If it's on there, it's vetted and approved by yours truly. And if it's not on there, it's probably not worth the money. 
So go ahead and get yours at growyourshow.com forward slash PDF. Let's get back into the show. We're back with Chef Adam Lamb, and we want to get his thoughts, uh, what he's learned along the way. I mean, with hundreds of episodes, a couple different podcasts, maybe even starting a third. By the way, he doesn't want you to do that. He says you should just start one, (laughs) but he might have three. Death sentence, death wish, I'm not sure. But let's go in with these things. But I do want to recap just a couple cool things that we've learned with you today, Adam. One of them is just the avatar. You mentioned you came back to the avatar. You focus on the avatar. You may have felt like you were getting away from the avatar. I know a lot of podcasters resonate with that. And you had three questions, and I think you could have come up with more. And you basically said, who is the podcast for? Or who's my business for? Right. You asked the second question was, what's the transformational story? And the third was, what gets them there? What do I do to get that person there? And I think those are some really cool, great questions that can help us to be able to serve an avatar more. And I can tell that that's what your main focus is right now is outward, not inward. It's how do I help? And as part of how do I help my listener? How do I help my client? How do I help my potential client? How do I help other chefs? Sure. It's like, what am I doing this for? Who is it for? What's that story that they are going to resonate with? And what's going to get them to listen? And what's going to get them to take the call to action, whether it's simple or not simple? What's going to get them to hire me and so I can support them? And I thought that was a really insightful piece. And there's been quite a bit more, include them in the podcast. That's a huge quote, include them in the podcast, the hot seat audit where you're inviting them to come on. I think it was for like 15 minutes or something, but Mm -hmm. I liked the thought of including your listener as part of the podcast. I thought that was insightful as well. And I think we should all be thinking about community. We should all be thinking about that. Somehow you were able to get 200 advisory council. You mentioned (laughs) that it came on social media, on Facebook. You feeding in and adding to the message, like commenting, making posts, not about you, not about what you need, but just things that are helpful. And I think that those are some things that all of us can do more if we want to be able to grow a podcast. So those were some really insightful things. Now to the part where I mentioned right before the break, (laughs) I said, we're going to come back and Adam's going to share with us a couple things that he's learned along the way, tips, tricks, strategies, or whatever. Adam, like, where does your heart go right there? Thinking about a brand new podcaster, someone who's only been doing it a year or two, what can you do to help them on their journey? Sure. Anybody who's really interested in growing their show is probably going to come back to the point of like, is my podcast any good? Like, why would anybody listen to it? And the first place I would start is why? Why do you think that you need a podcast? Now, I don't want to dissuade anybody or squash anybody's dreams, but I've been having the same conversation with my wife, who's a transformational coach and teacher, and she knows podcasts are hot. And like, I want you to help me with my podcast. And I'd say, why? Why do you want a podcast? Like, Articulate to me why you think that it serves your business, which wasn't the question I was asking myself at the beginning. I was just like looking for something to do. I didn't understand that it's actually a part of my business. So some people are really good at video. Some people are really good at writing. Some people are really good at audio. And so to go to your strength really serves you. And I'm not saying don't try to podcast format because I've really enjoyed it. I know that you've built an entire business around it, but I would just like get really clear about what's your why. And then once you understand that, then you're looking at who you serve. I even went to the extent of going online, finding a picture of a 30 something year old chef, and then drafting out a paragraph of where he is in his life. Because the other thing that you need to understand to be a great podcaster is what's their pain point? My avatar, what's his or her pain point? Because that's what I want to be. That's first off where they get to see themselves because that's what I'm going to use to get people there. If they see themselves in me or in my message, then they'll be more apt to like, okay, let me see what this is all about. And then that serves your title. That also serves your podcast description. It also serves as your North Star. Anything that's not congruent with that, any guest that's not congruent with that, any story that's not congruent with serving that message, it's simple. You just don't do it, right? <laughs> and lastly, I would say you get to take all that information and put it into a 10-word description. So you want an elevator pitch. For me, it's for chefs who want to enjoy their careers without sacrificing their life. So I have it where who it's for, where they're at, and what they want. So anybody who's in that space, 
And don't be worried about niching down. You should be niched so tightly that it feels uncomfortable, that you're like worried that that doesn't represent a large enough possible listenership. The fact of the matter is you're going to get guys or listeners peripherally to your avatar. We're going to want to know what the hell's going on over there. And some of your greatest advocates probably are going to be folks who are not necessarily within that niche, but close to it. Then scrub your social media. Make sure that every social media profile of yours is exactly the same message. And with like that image header should only be your podcast cover and the link to your podcast, because you don't really want to post about your podcast, but you want it to be very easy for folks to understand what you do and how you do it. And lastly, I would say take 15 minutes a day, make sure that you're going to where your avatars are and you call them around a water cooler. And that's usually some type of Facebook group or LinkedIn group or whatever. Make sure you're going in those groups 15 minutes a day, either commenting on someone else's posts or commenting on someone else's comments and posting one comment. So there's a whole strategy around LinkedIn right now that is blowing up. It's now becoming a huge creator workspace. And if you're not on LinkedIn, you got to check it out because it is not your grandfather's want ads anymore. I mean, it is a dynamic opportunity. And one of the strongest things is LinkedIn has a built-in newsletter function. So you can actually create your little newsletter there and everybody who's liked you or you're in contact with automatically gets a invitation and then also automatically gets an email with that newsletter. So it's a great way to consistently keep connected with your listeners in a way that doesn't cost you any additional money and is pretty dynamic. I got 10-ish steps (laughs) and a bonus. Step one was know your why. Yeah. Step two was find out who you're serving. Step mm-hmm. three is find out their pain point. Mm-hmm. Five is you figure out the title of the podcast through the pain point. Six yeah. was you figure out the podcast description through all of that. Seven was that is your North Star. If you're not going to interview somebody who doesn't support that, you're not going to have any content that doesn't support that. Mm-hmm. Number eight was figure out your short elevator pitch. Yep. The bonus was don't worry about niching down too far. The ninth one out of 10 was <laughs> scrub your whole social media. If it's not about the podcast, if it's not about how you serve, you get rid of it and simplify it and do that across all of the platforms that you're on, including LinkedIn, Facebook, and others. Mm-hmm. And then the 10th one was to go and find that water cooler 15 minutes a day. Mm-hmm. Spend 15 minutes a day, every single day, getting around those people that you serve, finding out their new pain point is... right knowing how they talk, how they feel about things, if they like this new thing that's coming out, if they don't like it. And that allows you to continue to serve them at a high level. I love it. That's a perfect nutshell, man. So Turning the Table podcast Mm -hmm. is a podcast where Adam joins in with a friend of his. I think it was Tim. Jim. Jim Taylor. (laughs) Jim Taylor. As a dyslexic, that's me. Of course, I would have put the T for Taylor in the J. And then also Chef Life Radio, those links are in the show notes. There's a third link that's in the show notes and that's cheflifecoaching.com. And so that way, if you are a chef, you can go and check it out. Or if you've got a friend who needs to check out the podcast, you can send that friend, the Turning the Table podcast, the Chef Life podcast and or cheflifecoaching.com. All those links are in the show notes and go check out the podcast if it serves you and jump over there. Check out what Adam's doing. And I would say that I came away with a couple of learning lessons myself, one of which was to not have to have those two different personalities. And I'm going to over-exaggerate it for a second. Being a dick and down to business (laughs) when you're at work and being a sweetheart and loving and nurturing when you're at home. And I know that's polar opposite, but this is the example of What do we have to do to make sure that we are serving people and helping people? And we got to remember that people are human. All humans are humans. All people Mm -hmm. are people. And we can have that connection, that mentality about with them and not against them. And that was helpful for me as well, because I've got quite a bit of employees and a local assistant who cooks and cleans at the house. Mm -hmm. And I would say sometimes I'm too down to business. I'm having a hard time figuring out where to draw that line. Mm. That was really helpful for me as well. I really appreciate you, Adam. And maybe we'll have you back on the show. I would love that, Adam. Thanks very much, brother. All right. If you're listening, and I know you are, don't go away. Just see us on the very next episode. (laughs) Be right there. You know, I really don't say this nearly enough. I don't mention this and I feel horrible because it's a great resource 
for you to be able to take your podcast to the next level. And it's simply a free resource that I don't need your email or anything. It's just a podcasting course that I created that is ended up putting in the very first six episodes of this podcast. So if you haven't checked it out, definitely going to want to just check out those first six episodes, see how they can help you improve your podcast, get in front of more people and have a better result where you're making more money through the podcast, etc. So much can happen after you listen through episodes one, two, three, four, five, and six. So if you haven't done it, go do it now. And by the way, if you're subscribed, you'll keep hearing more great content. So to those of you who are, I'll see you on the next episode.